Welcome to Skillings Masterclass on how electric vehicles work. EVs over the past two decades have quickly become an alternative solution to IC engine cars. While our traditional cars offer a lot of comfort as we drive around them every day, they actually cause a lot of harm than we can imagine. While over the past few decades, we've seen the likes of Tesla, Nissan and BMW come up with their own solutions for electric vehicles, in India itself, we've seen the likes of Tata, Aether Energy and Ola come up with their own solutions. But electric vehicles are actually not a new concept at all. They've been around for more than 100 years. In fact, in India, we've been having them on the roads for more than 15 years now. In this video series, we are going to learn everything there is about electric vehicles. And for that, we have Vatsal Shah here with us, who is our in-house guru. Hey Vatsal, how are you? Hey, hi Srinath, I'm good, thanks. Let's get started then. Sure. Awesome. So, Vatsal, tell me, how does an electric vehicle actually work? In most simple words, uh, electric vehicles are battery powered and motor operated vehicles. So, you get all the energy from the, uh, you get all this energy stored in the battery and that energy is going to power up the motor, which in turn is going to drive the wheels. So, that's as simple as any battery operated or motorized device, uh, which you, you might have seen in a day-to-day -day life. While electric vehicles are being talked a lot about today, let's not forget that batteries have been around for more than 100, 150 years and motors have been there for a longer time as well. So what took engineers such a long time to put the two together? It's not just about putting these two items together. It's all about engineering behind that and it's all about having a successful technology uh, which is capable of working on road. And on top of it, you also need to have a viable solution uh, which is uh, affordable and which actually penetrates into the market. So, yes, batteries are old, motors are older than that, and but you need to have a systematic way of integrating them together. And in fact, it's not like nobody tried earlier. Uh, so, first electric vehicle prototype was built in 1828. And at that time, rechargeable batteries were not available. And those experiments actually failed. But over the period of time, people have not stopped trying for an electric vehicle. So if I give you an example, uh, the electric technology for moving people and goods from one place to another is very successful for the case of railways. The electric multiple units are able to survive successfully since years. And now you see the any railway today, uh, it's not actually powered conventionally by the engine. Even if the tracks are not electrified, these trains are diesel electric, which means they take power from diesel and convert it into electricity. And that electricity is going to power up the motors and that's how the trains work. But at that point of time, batteries were having so many limitations in terms of their power density, in terms of their uh, proper usage for the electric vehicle and motors also were evolving. So batteries and motors are uh, not just two components which requires to be existed, but they have to evolve in order to match the requirements of the vehicle, which are mobile vehicles. Okay, so essentially what has happened is, while electricity has been used to drive vehicles forward, it was possible because the source of electricity and the traction motor were separate. Correct. But it's taken time to bring the two together into one independent unit. Is that right? Yes. So what has changed over the past 100 years that the mating of the traction motor and the battery is possible now? So battery technology have evolved over the years and that is possible due to those all successful chemistries have came out of the lab and now they are into manufacturing. So we have got successful rechargeable batteries and not only that we have also got a higher power density which means you are able to get more energy in the less volume and at the same time the cost of batteries have drastically reduced which has made possible to be deployed for electric vehicle application if evs are such a great alternative to ic engine cars why are we seeing so few EVs on the road today because 
less than 1% of all the vehicles on our roads are electric vehicles. First thing in order for EVs to get onto the road, uh, you need to understand two things. First is the demand and the other is the supply. At the moment, the electric vehicles are in less demand because of their high cost. Now, let me tell you what's the reason for the high cost of electric vehicles. So the EV manufacturers or uh, the automaker companies are manufacturing electric vehicles at very low volume. If you have very less number of pieces to be made, right, uh, it's obviously going to cost you more. So this is similar to a chicken and egg situation. How do we break the cycle? In order to have more electric vehicle adoption, there are two ways. First is you get more technology push from the government in the form of subsidy and the customers are more attracted towards buying an electric vehicle. But in long run, the demand, the natural demand from the customers is going to drive this change. And that is going to happen if customers realize the benefits of utilizing an electric vehicle. Can you tell me how do you start your vehicle which has an engine? I have a push button start. So when you press a button or when you apply ignition, your vehicle is going to start with the help of battery and a starter motor. And that is the technology which I call as micro hybrid electric vehicle. If what I'm driving is called a micro hybrid and it's a form of an electric vehicle, then what are the other forms of electric vehicles available today? Depending on how electric technology is deployed, that decides various categories. Maruti Suzuki Ertiga is one example of mild hybrid electric vehicle. And if you put more and more power into the battery and the motor, you get the higher version of the electric and hybrid electric vehicle. So Toyota Prius is one such example of full hybrid vehicle where even if you do not have a drop of a petrol or diesel in your tank, you are able to run your car totally on electric power. So this is called as a full hybrid vehicle. The next category is when you realize the benefits of using the motor to fully power your vehicle, you do not need an engine at all. And that is called as a pure electric vehicle. Can you tell us the differences between powering a vehicle with fuel versus powering a vehicle with electricity alone? The major difference is the efficiency at which you operate. So electric vehicles are far more efficient than IC engine vehicles. In your IC engine vehicle, you have the stored chemical energy in the fuel. You burn the fuel inside the engine. You convert them into a thermal energy. And that thermal energy is converted into mechanical energy by rotating the shaft of the engine and finally the wheels. Well, this is a three-stage conversion and it's so much inefficient. On the other hand, electric vehicles have already stored the charge in the form of electricity inside the battery. And now you need to just convert that electrical power to the mechanical power which is required to run the vehicle. And therefore, it's just one stage conversion. That is just efficiency. What about affordability? Because the entry barrier for buying an electric vehicle is already quite high. What about the recurring expenses of an electric vehicle? Can you tell me exactly how much you spend uh, with your petrol car? Uh, per kilometer cost? I yes. I think probably about six to seven rupees. So running a vehicle for per kilometer is going to cost you six to seven rupees, right? Now at the same time, if you have an electric vehicle, you are going to run that vehicle at less than one rupees a kilometer because electricity is cheaper compared to the price of petrol and diesel. And that's how they are actually more affordable. And now if you do this systematic calculation of initial cost, running cost and all other costs involved including maintenance and replacement of battery, that is known as total cost of ownership. That's an actually very interesting comparison between electric vehicles and uh, traditional IC engine cars. Can you walk us through what exactly we'll be learning through this entire video series? In this masterclass, we are going to cover all the things that are part of an electric vehicle. We are going to first start with the mechanical design aspects. We'll also look at electrified powertrain. And the next point we are going to cover is all about electric vehicle batteries. And the last section 
is all about auxiliary systems. So this way, uh, in this master class, we will talk about all the components that an electric vehicle has. Obviously, it becomes a whole lot easier to understand the engineering of an electric vehicle if we actually had one in hand. And guess what? We do. Isn't that right, Watson? Yes. At Skilling, we have built an electric vehicle platform from scratch, which helps us to know more about electric vehicle. And this way, we are able to translate our knowledge to our students who are learning about electric vehicles. And, and in this video series, we are going to cover everything, rather uncover everything about an electric vehicle. Okay, let's get started then. This looks fantastic. This yes. was built entirely at Skilling. Is that right? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. So this is just the first part of our masterclass in which we learn everything about electric vehicles. And I hope you are as curious as I am to find out more. Welcome back to Skillings Masterclass on Electric Vehicles. In the previous section, we talked about how electric vehicles have been in development for more than 100 years now. And we also saw how they lost out to IC engines over the past century and how they're making a comeback now. In this section, we are going to talk about this electric vehicle that we at Skilling have built from scratch. Watson, tell me, this car actually doesn't look anything like a passenger vehicle available for sale outside. Can you tell us what was the idea behind building it like this? Well, this car doesn't look like an actual car, but it is capable of running on road. And we built this with all minimum requirements uh, to keep it more simple and straightforward. So we wanted to have a demo car, uh, which is capable of running on the road. And we get the data out of it in order to match with our computer simulation. So with this vehicle, we are able to do a lots of experiments and try to get more and more idea about how an electric vehicle works. So with this hands-on approach, we are able to learn so many more things about an electric vehicle. Uh, you said this is an experimental test bed, right? Can you tell us what are the kind of experiments you were able to perform on this? With this vehicle, we are able to perform experiments like running it at various speeds and we are able to kind of uh, get more idea about uh, how much is the power consumed at various levels of speed and what is going to happen if I am driving alone or if I have four more people joining with me and we have actually taken it to the ride on, uh, on a flyover as well as uh, taking it out of the basement and that helps us to test this vehicle for all the real world driving conditions. And what have you learned from these experiments that you've performed? So, with this experimental data that is available from this vehicle, uh, we are able to match with the computer simulation. And with that, we can see more about the design of the vehicle as well as the performance of the vehicle. So, this experimental data also enhances our knowledge on how an electric vehicle works and how this component put all together works. Can you quickly walk us through the entire mechanical design of the vehicle? Sure. Let me show you how the mechanical design of this vehicle is. The skeleton of any vehicle is a chassis. On front side here you can see some of the chassis components and this is entirely up to the end of the vehicle and the four wheels are going to keep the vehicle rolling. And these front wheels are supported by the front suspension here. And the front wheels are going to get direction from the steering wheel. This dashboard helps driver to get all the data out of the vehicle and what's happening inside. The seats can accommodate approximately five passengers here as you can see. And on the rear side of the vehicle, we have the battery and motor which powers up the entire vehicle. Okay, and I'm assuming these are Parking brakes, handbrakes? Yes, this is a handbrake 
and here just below the steering you can see uh, we have a throttle paddle and the brake okay excellent you had earlier mentioned that you had used simulations while building this vehicle on a mechanical front can you tell us what was the role of simulations uh, while building this so from mechanical design point of view we have done two major simulations first is in order to identify four setting on each member of this chassis we have done finite element analysis with the help of software called ansys now another way of figuring out how this vehicle runs mechanically on the road we need to perform a lot of calculations of vehicle dynamics for example i wanted to know what is the turning radius with this steering mechanism or i wanted to know what will be the air drag for example if this vehicle is covered with a body completely we need to figure out that so we have done that simulation with the help of matlab and simulate so this data help us to know more about the selection of the components and that's how useful are the simulations okay and how did you actually put this entire thing together so first we need to identify the skeleton of the system which is chassis so to build the chassis we have taken two large components which are spread across the length of the vehicle and this two components are joined together with the horizontal lines which are now going to frame a ladder frame chassis so first the the chassis was built and fabricated and joined together all all the components were joined together with the welding and then we mounted four wheels and along with the suspension now with the chassis and the wheels mounted we are ready to roll out the vehicle on the floor and able to check whether all the four wheels are on the level now once that is done we added the steering and tested with the steering angle by pushing the vehicle manually later on we added all the seats uh, so that passengers can sit comfortably now after all this we mounted brakes to all four wheels and the brake pedal now this is all minimum requirement for a mechanical aspect of a vehicle the other aspect which is electrical and electronics we tested battery along with the charger separately we tested motor with battery and the motor driver separately and we have tested how the changing the throttle change the speed of the motor and with this electrical and mechanical system tested separately we integrated them into one system one vehicle so that that is the point where we are able to do the first trial of the vehicle okay can you tell us a bit more about the steering column so steering system is very important part of any vehicle now this steering is a warm wheel gear type of uh, steering with the pitman arm now the way it works is when you try to rotate this steering wheel it is going to rotate this steering rod over here and this steering rod is going to move the pitman arm which is located here now this pitman arm is connected with the central rod and that actually rotates or that actually shift my front wheels to the right or the left side as per the driver requirement so in a way you can say that this steering mechanism is rotational to translational motion converter and i can see that the front suspensions are different from the suspensions in the rear can you tell us the difference between the two so the front suspension is actually a macpherson type of a suspension where it has a helical spring type of structure which is going to absorb the shock and in order to keep on in order to avoid keep on oscillating just after you pass a speed breaker you need a damper to actually damp out the oscillation now that is done by a member which is in the center part of the helical spring and that damper along with the helical spring forms the macpherson strut type suspension so what about the rear suspension rear suspension is leaf spring type of a suspension and it is different from the front suspension so leaf spring suspension it doesn't consist of the classical spring or you do not see any structure of a spring but it still opposes all the forces acting on 
the chassis on the upward direction and it is made up of group of sections which are steel sections and they are uh, they are tied up together and banded so that it opposes all the forces acting on the vehicle and that is how the leaf spring suspension works coming back to the basics you said that this is an experimental test bed right now what are the limitations of this in comparison to a passenger vehicle that runs on the road well this vehicle uh, does not have a body at all and it may not be that safe and we haven't considered uh, crash requirements as well and for example we do not have safety belt or we do not have uh, uh, the airbags as well right uh, so all those things kept aside we have considered all the minimum requirements to run a vehicle and along with this from electrical point of view we are able to take this vehicle to the maximum of 35 kilometers per hour speed along with the range of the vehicle which is not exceeding 50 kilometers this is Skillnik's masterclass on how electric vehicles work. And if you've not watched our previous section, I strongly suggest that you do, because until now, we've talked about the evolution of electric vehicles, how they've been in the development for more than 100 years now, and how they're making a comeback after losing the battle to IC engine cars. And in this section, we just covered how Skillnik built this test bed from scratch. And coming up, we are going to take a deeper dive into the workings of an electric vehicle. back to Skilling's masterclass on how electric vehicles work. Until now, we've covered the evolution of electric vehicles, how they lost out to IC engine cars, and how they're making a comeback. We've also seen how we at Skilling managed to build an electric vehicle of our own to understand the workings of it. But it doesn't just stop there. To understand how electric vehicles work, we need to look into the powertrain of the vehicle. And at the heart of that powertrain is the motor. Isn't that right, Matsu? Yes. To begin with, let me help you to understand how the vehicle is motorized and what are the various configurations of motorizing the vehicle. So we can connect motor to the rear axle that is called rear wheel drive. We can connect motor to the front wheel and that is called as front wheel drive. And it's also possible to have all wheel drive and the four wheel drive. More number of the motor, uh, higher will be the output mechanical power to run the vehicle. But we need to take care of how we are distributing the power. So, for example, if I want to build an electric sports car and if I put a whole lot of power in just the rear wheel and it is likely that when I accelerate that vehicle very fast, the front wheel might get uh, lifted up and which may not be that safe. So, in order to ensure the grip and the traction of the wheel to the roads, we need to come up with the distribution of power to the both front and the rear axle. So it, it's totally dependent on the requirement of the vehicle that what kind of configuration we'll choose, whether we'll go for rear wheel drive or all wheel drive or front wheel drive. So more number of motors, more power consumed. Yes. How do you transfer the power from the motor to the wheels? So first, uh, the staff power is going to be transmitted to a gearbox, which is usually a reduction gearbox. It is going to reduce the speed uh, of the shaft of the motor to the wheels. And it is also having a differential. Now, this differential is going to take care of the difference of RPM from your left wheel to the right wheel while you are taking a turn. And the group of gearbox along with a differential and the shaft, which is going to transmit the power to the wheels is together called as a transaxle. So transaxle is combination of transmission components and the axle component. I drive a manual transmission car, right? So I have to go from the first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear in order for me to go faster. Because if I'm in the first, I really can't zoom in at 100. Even automatic cars have planetary gear systems which do it automatically, obviously. But this car uses a single speed transmission. So how does that actually work? How, how is it different from a multi-gear transmission system? Srinath, some of the electric vehicles do not require any transmission system at all. 
The beauty of the electric vehicle is that the motors are capable to run over a wide speed range of the vehicle. So motors are controlled in such a way that they can operate at various torque and speed requirements. So this is the reason why electric vehicles have single speed gearbox. How do you reverse the car? Because I don't see any gear for reversing it or anything of that sort. Well, to reverse the car, actually, motors are capable of doing that as well. So if you control the motor and the direction of current flowing through the motor, then the motors are able to rotate in the reverse direction. Let's go to the vehicle and let's see how the reverse function of this vehicle works. Excellent. So here I'm going to show you how the vehicle runs in forward and reverse direction just with the help of a switch. So this is a dashboard and I'm going to turn on the main supply with the help of this key. So here I just turned on the main supply, let me turn on the battery level as well. Okay. And now we are ready to go. So this switch actually decides whether your vehicle is going to move forward or it will be running in the backward direction. So now if I apply the throttle, you will see that the wheels are spinning in the forward direction. Okay, so how do you get it to go in reverse? Oh, you just click the switch. Exactly. Yeah, so, okay. So the reverse has an indicator that it's going in reverse, right? With the red light over here. And now if I press the throttle, it is going to spin in the reverse direction. Okay. So basically with just the flick of a switch, you reverse the polarity. Exactly. So we do not need a sophisticated reverse gear for the electric vehicle. So Watson, tell me, are there different kinds of motors that can be used in electric vehicles or are all of them just the same? So there are a couple of motors which are called as outrunner motor, uh, which does not require any transmission at all. And there are other types of motors for electric vehicle which requires a transmission and they are called inrunner motor. So let me take you through how an outrunner motor look like. So the similar motor is used in the scooter uh, that you came in and this motor is actually the part of the wheel as you can see here. Okay. So electric vehicle motors which do not require any transmission at all, they are actually so tiny and they are able to adjust and accommodate inside the structure of the wheel itself. So this type of motors are very popular for uh, two-wheelers and some of the electric uh, vehicles such as Segway or the small kick scooter. What are in-runner motors and how are they different from out-runner motors that you spoke about? Let me take that motor to the table and show you how it looks like. Awesome. Okay. So this is the in-runner motor where you can see the shaft in the center and usually the motors that you see for the pump, you see for compressor applications, they are all in-runner motors. And this motor where the shaft is coming out from the center, it requires a transmission system. For example, in electric vehicle, we need a gearbox to be connected between the shaft of the motor and the wheels. Okay. On the other hand, the motor which is like this, which is the outrunner motor or the hub motor, do not require any transmission system. The reason is, whatever is the speed of this motor is same as the speed of the vehicle. Now, let me give you a couple of other differences between uh, the hub motor or the outrunner motor and the inrunner motor. So, usually the outrunner motors or hub motors are preferred for the application of vehicles which requires low power. So hub motors are available in the range of uh, 250 watt to 3 kilowatt. But if you want to have power more than 3 kilowatt, this motors may not be feasible. Does it mean that there are different types of motors which can run an electric vehicle? There are different ways of classifying the motors used in electric vehicle. 
one classification we have seen is what is the location of rotor with respect to stator another way of classification is how do they generate the magnetic field so motors can generate magnetic field in two major ways one is either they can use a permanent magnet or they can use an electromagnet so the electromagnets are going to work where you need an external electrical supply to generate the magnetic field and if i tell you more about the motors used for electric vehicle which are permanent magnet motors they can be further classified like brush type dc motor if you have seen uh, an electric sweeper at airport or if you have seen uh, automated guided vehicle which are used in industries these motors are brush type permanent magnet dc motors and the other types of motors which are brushless type of dc motors which are very popular for two wheelers and they are usually the hub motors and they are called as permanent magnet brushless dc motor the other category is permanent magnet synchronous motor so permanent magnet synchronous motor can be further classified into many more types of motor based on how we are having the orientation of the magnets within them Do you mean to say that all electric vehicles use only permanent magnet motors? No, there are various choice among the designer where they decide whether they use permanent magnet motors or non-permanent magnet motors. So there are several cases where non-permanent magnet motors are used by electric vehicle manufacturers. So one of the example is Mahindra E two O, which uses an induction motor, and the early versions of Tesla have been also using induction motor, which is the one of the category of non permanent magnet motors so non permanent magnet motors are equally of importance for electric vehicle application let me classify further the non permanent magnet motors used for electric vehicle now one of the category is brush type dc motor and this brush type dc motors are going to be excited by a separate windings and the classical example of this is a dc series motor which is which was very popular for the railway application earlier and the next category is the induction motor induction motor have been the king of all the motors and it's it's so successful and rugged in construction that it's been used since many years for many applications and induction motors can also be used for electric vehicles as well and one of the other category which is evolving is actually the switch reluctance motor and the switch reluctance motor is also not using any permanent magnet at all and the stator magnetism and the rotor magnetism are both developed with the help of the electromagnets so these are all category of non permanent magnet motors which are equally applicable for electric vehicles can you tell us in detail how these motors actually work well to understand how a motor works uh, we need to understand more about the construction of the motor and the way they produce the torque so the operation of the motor can be compared with the game of magnets so your stator consists of magnets which has north pole and south pole your rotor also consists of magnets which are north pole and south pole now the way it attracts and repels that is basically going to form the harmony of unidirectional torque and that is how the motor keeps on rotating in one direction well in order to change the direction of the magnetic field of the stator or the windings we need to change the direction of current passing through it how do we change that we need to understand that for a rotor which is rotating it's difficult to keep on changing the direction of the winding which is already rotating therefore we need a fixed connection of the rotating winding and that is achieved in a simple motor such as dc motor by having a commutator and brush mechanism is it possible to actually take a look into these motors and see how these components are what what exactly goes on inside sure sinan so i'm going to take the first simple motor that i have on the table and this motor as you can see it's a tiny motor used for a small toy car well those toy cars are also a battery operated vehicle and you can call them as electric vehicle as well i'm going to take you through what is it consists of what it is made up of so first you can see outside 
this is input electrical terminal and this is the shaft where you get the output power from and this is where you can connect your wheels directly or maybe through a gear so here if i open up this this is a brush type permanent magnet dc motor and if i open up this the very first thing i'm going to look at is the brushes so let me take let me open this and what you can see on the terminal box is the two brushes over here so these are the two brushes which are going to make the fixed contact to the rotating winding now when the windings are rotating you need to make sure you are going to keep the terminals engaged electrically engaged and this is done through this two brushes and as you can see there is some sort of a spring action which is going to keep it connected with the commutator now this brushes are going to connect to the commutator let me show you now what is a commutator so i'm going to put this down and i will open up the commutator so this is where the body of the motor is and if i take the rotor out so i'm going to take the rotor out this really tiny one and i'm i'm going to show you this how it looks like so what you are able to see on the top are the commutator segments and this is where exactly the brushes will get connected and through this the motor windings which you can see over here are going to get supplied so these are the copper windings which you can see and this copper windings are going to get supply and this is going to form an electromagnet and and in a way this is a current carrying conductor now a current carrying conductor should be placed in a magnetic field where do we get the magnetic field from well here is a magnetic field i just have taken out this rotor from this stator let me explain you what is inside the stator now so if you look at the inside of the stator so this is the inside of a stator and here you can see there are two permanent magnets so this is a two pole brush type dc motor where this two magnets are going to generate the required magnetism and therefore the current carrying conductor is placed in a magnetic field and it is going to experience the force and because this is a rotating body it is going to produce the torque this is how simply a permanent magnet brush type dc motor works can we see a bigger version of this for example the one which is used on the scooter or one which is used in the uh, electric vehicle that we built the four wheeler that we built can we see a larger version of this so here it is so the permanent magnet brushless dc motor is also called as hub motor or the outrunner motor well i'm going to open this up and show you exactly how it look like help me out yeah okay finally it's out uh so this is one of the bearing uh, which is going to hold the stator right and as i explained this is exactly uh, the construction of a wheel right so here this is in wheel motor or a hub motor where you can see these are the magnets on the outer periphery and therefore it's called the outer rotor and these are the windings which is inside and this shaft is not actually for the rotor this shaft is going to fix it with your steady part of the vehicle and therefore uh, it is going to remain steady now if i pull this out i'm going to able to better explain how is the construction of the stator and the rotor so we are going to make it separate and study how exactly it works ah this is challenge <laughs> yeah you want me to pull it out yeah ah. ah finally i am able to get it out thanks so so what you are able to see here is a stator part and uh, as i said this shaft is going to remain steady with the vehicle so this is all windings these are all three phase windings where the terminals are taken out and they are basically star connected which means their other end is going to be common and the the remaining three ends are going to be powered by the inverter 
so as you can see uh, this state rewinding consists of something called as hall sensor and we need hall sensors to actually get the position of the rotor and these are three hall sensors as you can see there is a green color pcb right so this printed circuit board is actually helping us to connect all the three sensors with 5 volt supply and you are able to get the output of all the three sensors now where the sensors are actually located at where you are able to see them here so they are part of the stator core over here so one is here the other is what you are able to see here and the other is here so these are the hall sensors which is going to detect whether a magnet is present or not if a magnet is present it is going to generate a digital signal which is going to tell the microcontroller how uh, what where is the position of the rotor well this is about stator you can see it from here you will see the decent winding uh, done and here you can see the decent winding uh, done over here and now i'm going to take you through how the rotor looks like so here i have a rotor in my hand and this is actually a wheel if you see from this side this is actually a wheel right and this is going to rotate so whatever is my wheel speed that is exactly the motor speed so these are the rotor magnetic poles and this rotor magnetic poles are distributed across the periphery of the motor and now the motor is designed in such a way that you decide how many magnets you are able to accommodate and how many rotor number of poles that you are going to have and while the motor is excited from the three phase inverter to the stator winding this rotor is going to spin like this and the rotor position is going to change so this is exactly how a hub motor or out runner motor is going to work okay and what about that one the in runner motor so this in runner motor is having a shaft on its center well uh, this is the shaft and these are the gears as you can see on on the top of it uh, uh, it's too heavy so here you can see the shaft and the gears which are on the surface of this where you are going to mount your gearbox and then differential and the transaxle and the wheel so if i open it up you will be able to see the internal structure of it so just help me out with this yeah. we are going to take out the side face of it from here yeah can you take this out hey thanks so these are the terminals and this is what an old motor used for a vehicle similar to an e rickshaw will look like so these are the three terminals that i have got and there are a couple of hall sensor wires similarly coming out uh, just like the hub motor or the out runner motor well i am not able to hold this for too long what i am going to do now is take another motor which is similar one but the stator and rotor are taken apart on the right hand i am holding a stator on my left hand here you have a rotor so as you can see there are three windings or three terminals coming out of the motor which is going to be connected to the inverter and you can see there are various number of electromagnets or i can call it as a stator magnetic poles which are distributed across the periphery of the stator and well the rotor is going to be inside of it and therefore in runner motor so so now i'm holding rotor in my hand and this rotor as you can see it has a shaft on both the hands and it is going to be carried by the bearings like this so bearings are basically going to hold the rotor and it is going to maintain the air gap uniform across the 360 degree of the mechanical motor and this is how your rotor magnets look like can you see some magnets here yeah so this is not a single magnet bar there are series of magnets bar across the entire rotor over here and if i get one magnet out this is going to how it look like so this bar of magnet is going to reside over here like this 
so this is exactly how it is going to be inserted here now the other part of the rotor which holds the magnet is basically the rotor core and the rotor core is a material which is going to offer the lowest magnetic reluctance to the path of the magnetic flux okay as you can see there is nothing inside this actually helps to pass through a lot of air through it and keeps the rotor cool and there is no need for extra material as such right and therefore they are kept hollow so this is how the rotor works and this is the construction of the in runner motor you mentioned something called as a hall sensor which you said over here you said that these are hall sensors correct so these are the hall sensors used in in runner motor okay and you can see a pair of three uh, so these are the three hall sensors mounted on a printed circuit board and they are going to stand just near to the magnets where the rotor permanent magnets are situated okay so these are the three sets of hall sensor located in the motor how does the hall sensor actually work so hall sensors are basically a sensor which helps me to know whether a magnet is there or not and if i know whether the magnet is passing through the hall sensor i am able to decide where is the rotor now so well here for simplicity i have kept a hall sensor on a pcb module so here you can see the three terminal hall sensor in black color and these are the hall sensors which are going to detect uh, the presence of a magnet and here with the battery i am giving a supply and this is going to help me to detect whether a magnet is there chinnat can you help me bring a magnet close to the hall sensor and see what happens sure so if the magnet is near to the hall sensor you are going to see the blue light getting turned on yeah yeah so that is going to indicate whether a magnet is there or not and if you take the magnet away from it the blue light is going to turn off you really need to bring the magnet quite close to the sensor exactly so because the hall sensors are going to be located very near to this rotor magnet amazing and this way it's not just turning on the light you need to send this signal to the microcontroller which is going to understand what is happening to all the three hall sensors together and that's how the rotor position is detected clearly these motors come with their own advantages and disadvantages right now how do you decide which motor is the most suited for the job well we need to compare them on various aspects uh for electric vehicle application uh there are four major aspects that i'm going to cover now so first is the cost and the availability of the material so the cost of permanent magnet motors are high the reason is the raw material available for manufacturing the permanent magnet and their availability is going to be challenging so on the other side the non permanent magnet motors are constructed in such a way that they are using the simple materials such as iron and copper which is widely available the second point of comparison is torque to weight ratio so permanent magnet motors have more magnetic field established due to the concentrated permanent magnets and therefore they generate more magnetic field and their weight is going to be less on the other side non permanent magnet motors are going to be larger in the size and they require more windings to generate the magnetism which is done by electromagnet so the third comparison is the complexity of the control of the motor permanent magnet motors are very easy to control you can develop the required torque and speed by controlling the voltage and current which are given to the motor on the other hand the non permanent magnet motors such as induction motor where the flux and the current they are actually coupled together and to control them like a dc motor you need to decouple them and therefore the complexity is higher 
If you talk about switch reluctance motor, they also have very complex software and hardware requirement in order to get the tailor-made characteristics. Until now, we've been getting our hands dirty with the inner workings of an electric motor. If you thought that was the end of it, there's more to come. Stay tuned. Now, let's come to our vehicle over here. Can you tell us what is the kind of motor that we've used on this one and what are the technical specifications of it? We have used permanent magnet brushless DC motor for this vehicle and uh, the reason behind it is we, we got a, a little amount of space and we need to accommodate the motor in the rear axle, right? And it need not to be so heavy. So therefore, we have selected permanent magnet brushless DC motor for this vehicle. So the very first uh, important specification of a traction motor is the voltage rating. So usually the traction motors are rated in terms of voltage with reference to the RPM. So this is a drone motor for which the key specification de decided as KV. And that refers to how much is the voltage required for the given RPM. So for this kind of motors, we have one volt for 1000 RPM to be produced by the motor. And for this motor that we have 60 volt, which gives me 3000 RPM. So that's the voltage rating of the motor. The second important rating is the current rating. So I need to produce enough amount of torque and the more torque I produce, more current is going to be drawn by the motor. So the motors also come up with a ratio or a factor called as torque to ampere ratio. So if I need to develop 10 Newton meter of torque, I need to supply X amount of current to the motor. Next is the power specification. So there are two power ratings of a motor. One is a continuous power rating. Another is a peak power rating or maximum power rating. So continuous power rating refers to the power output by the motor in order to run your vehicle at a constant speed. For example, this motor that we have used is around 3 kilowatt power and this motor is capable of generating 3 kilowatt continuously. Now, if I accelerate more and if I want to get higher acceleration, let's say uh, from 0 to 5 seconds, I want to accelerate to 45 kilometers per hour, I need more power in the short duration of time. And that rating is defined as a peak power rating. So motor can operate at above 3 kilowatt for shorter duration of time and that rating is known as a peak power rating. The next key specification I'm going to talk about are mainly the mechanical specification. So the key mechanical specification is the dimension of the motor and we got uh, also the CAD drawing of this motor so that we know how to fix it and assemble it. We also got to know about what is the weight of this motor and the other key important mechanical specification is what is the shaft arrangement? So some of the motors might have shaft on the both end. Some of the motors will have only single shaft. And this is very important consideration when you are going to mount your motor and transmit your power from the shaft of the motor to the wheels. Uh, what's the maximum range I can travel using these motors? Well, that depends on what is the duty of the motor that you have chosen, right? So for example, uh, if I give you a uh, real world scenario where let's say uh, you are using your motor in agricultural field where you need to keep on pumping the water from the tank to the field and that motor runs almost 24-7. On the other hand, if you take an example of the motor which is used for blender in a kitchen or a mixture grinder motor, that is going to be used for a very short period of time. So the selection of the motor is also done according to the duty of its rating. So when I say we have the long range vehicle such as Tesla, which is going to go for 250 to 350 kilometers and even more, these motors are to be rated according to how much time you need to cover that distance in single charge. Clearly, these 
electromagnetic motors generate a lot of heat while functioning right how do you cool them how do you make sure they they can run for a longer uh, period of time without overheating the motors that we have used in our vehicle is naturally cooled on the shaft of that motor there comes a fan which actually helps the air to pass through the stator and the rotor in the axial direction and while the vehicle is running there is a natural flow of air so this system is called as a natural cooling well this is for a low power vehicle what is going to happen if your motor is very high power and it is going to result into more amount of losses and more amount of heat generated in the motor in order to extract more heat out of the motor we need to use special arrangements called as force cooling arrangement so sometimes they are force fan cooling arrangements and other arrangements are force water cooling and some of the electric vehicle manufacturers and motor suppliers are recommending to use the glycol as a heat exchange medium and that basically cools down your electric vehicle motor um earlier you had mentioned that these motors can work across a wide range of torque right from the looks of it it looks like the battery is connected directly to a motor but there's got to be something in the middle for it to regulate this right is there any control mechanism which is there or is it directly up to the way the user presses the throttle and uh, regulates the motor well electric vehicles will have a regulator between a uh, battery and the motor and i'm going to discuss about that a bit late but let me take you through two scenarios right let's say you have a commercial vehicle which is capable of uh carrying 1 ton of weight and now if you put 2 tons of weight intentionally on the same vehicle what is going to happen well that vehicle is going to reduce its top speed and the acceleration right so you are going to basically able to cater to Two tons of load, but at the cost of reducing your top speed as well as acceleration. And let me give you another scenario. So you take a take an electric vehicle which has a five kilowatt motor. Now you keep the payload on that vehicle same, but replace the five kilowatt motor with a ten kilowatt motor. Now because your motor is more powerful, you are able to develop more torque and the speed. and therefore in this scenario you are going to get more top speed and the acceleration of the vehicle now combining these two scenarios whether your load on the vehicle is going to be affecting more or the power of the motor which is going to affect more the overall operation well it's actually depends on who is going to do the heavy lifting so it depends on how the characteristics of both motor and the vehicle are going to behave together how do you match the vehicle characteristics with the motor characteristics when we are talking about matching the power requirement of the vehicle with the motor we are actually talking about the mechanical power which is speed times the torque and in order to know more about the power i need to understand both about torque and the speed simultaneously therefore i'm going to now talk about the torque speed characteristics of the vehicle and the torque speed characteristics of the motor first let us go through the torque speed characteristics of the vehicle now when a vehicle is moving on the road there are various types of forces acting on the vehicle and one of such force is the rolling resistance force now this force remains almost constant throughout the speed of the vehicle and we can assume this is going to be a constant value on the other side the other force called as aerodynamic drag force is actually proportional to the square of the speed and now both of this forces are going to act together on the vehicle and therefore we need to combine the effect of both the forces into one and if i merge this two i'm going to get the characteristics which is going to be exponential with some offset on the y axis which is basically representing the starting torque if i know the radius of the wheel i can convert how much is the torque required on the wheel and convert the speed of the wheel which is linear speed to the rotating speed as well 
Now, if I get this torque and speed of the vehicle, and now I'm going to match it with the help of the motor torque speed characteristic. A simple DC motor is going to exhibit a characteristic where it, it is able to maintain the torque throughout the entire speed range. An ideal DC motor characteristic will be a straight horizontal line. For a practical DC motor, the torque is going to slightly reduce when the speed is increasing. And therefore, the practical characteristics of a DC motor is line with a negative slope. Now, if I get this characteristics of the motor, which is line with a negative slope and where the nature of the characteristics is hyperbolic, I'm going to match the units and the values on both the X axis and Y axis and put this graph together so that we can analyze what is going to be the operating point. In this case, the operating point is the intersection of these two curves, one line, one parabola. And this point refers to the point exactly at which the torque and speed of both the motor and the wheels are same. And that is going to be the point of operation. But that's just one ideal point, right? But the motor has to work across a wide range of speeds. How do you achieve that? So it's not just one operating point that we are able to get. Uh, obviously, we need to get multiple operating points so that we are able to operate vehicle at various different speeds. And imagine the way you drive your vehicle, right? It's not just like uh, you are running on a train, right? Which will go for a constant speed for a longer duration of time. You are driving a vehicle which is going to run on a road with wide change in the speed. So sometimes you brake, sometimes you accelerate. And the way your speed changes with reference to time is called as drive cycle. Now, in order to match all the drive cycle operating point and those level of the speed, you need to control the motor in such a way that you are able to produce the required torque speed characteristics that is demanded by the vehicle. So imagine what will happen if you have just one point. So let's say you are starting your vehicle and you have to reach to that particular point. It's not possible to reach at all without getting the mechanical assembly and the motor itself damaged because the motor has to produce too much of torque instantaneously and you cannot directly jump onto that operating point. Now, let me tell you how we are going to achieve various points on that characteristics. So, the motors are going to be controlled in such a way that it is going to not just have a single torque speed characteristics, but it is going to have family of torque speed characteristics depending on the voltage and current that you are going to feed into that. And those multiple characteristics are going to result into the various intersection points. So now, as you can see on the graph, you will have point A, which is going to be your starting point, where your speed is zero, but you have enough starting torque provided by the motor. And then it moves to point B, and then it moves to C, D, and finally, the top speed, which is represented by point F. And it's not only about how you start the vehicle. You are going to also run your vehicle at various operating points. So you are effectively, you are going to keep jumping on between A, B, C, D, E, F to F and then come to C and then go to B. Likewise, based on your drive cycle requirements. Okay. But how do you get the motor to work across this wide range of uh, torque that is required to run the vehicle? Well, to get the family of characteristics produced by the motor, you need a component called a motor controller between your battery and the motor. So the task of a motor controller is to regulate the power flowing from the battery to the motor. And this is similar to how you control the flow of a water coming out of a pipe using a valve. The more you open a valve, the more is the water flow you get out of it. How does a motor controller work? Well, motor controller is going to regulate the power flowing from the battery to the motor. This is done by using the power semiconductor devices. How do you send these signals to these semiconductor devices? So these control signals are going to be generated by an intelligent electronic circuitry, which are usually the microcontrollers or uh, similar chips. And these control signals 
cannot be directly applied to the power semiconductor switches because power semiconductor switches are operating at a power level and this control signals are at low voltage level and therefore you need a block in between which is called as a gate driver block and this is exactly the way you are opening the gate or a wall in order to regulate the amount of water flowing through a pipe the same way you can actually regulate the amount of voltage and the current appearing to the motor so this control signals will pass through the gate driver and gate driver is going to amplify and match the gate requirements of a power semiconductor devices so it translates from control voltage level to the power voltage level and therefore it is capable of making the switch on and off now the other part where let's say how your motor is going to experience the variable voltage across its terminal so the power semiconductor devices connects and disconnect the battery terminal to the motor windings and this happens so fast that the motor experiences the average voltage across it if i give you an example let's say you have a 100 voltage uh, battery pack so now if you turn on the switch for 2 milliseconds and if you keep the same switch off for the next 2 milliseconds and if you keep on doing that the motor is going to experience 50 volt across its winding and this method is called as a pulse width modulation so basically a motor controller is going to top out the voltage from the battery and it is going to regulate both voltage and current feed it to the motor winding and that's how the motor controller works and these gate drivers, obviously they are quite intelligent devices, but how do they know how much of voltage needs to be supplied to the motor? Well, the gate driver is going to be connected to the microcontroller unit. Now, the microcontroller is going to decide how much you need to open the semiconductor devices such that more power can flow from the battery to the motor. But that action of deciding the amount of power flowing from the battery to the motor is done by the driver. So the driver is going to press the throttle paddle and this throttle paddle is going to be detected by the microcontroller and that is going to now send signal to the gate driver. Now gate driver activates the devices and it commands them to open more and therefore more power flows to the motor. In order to understand more, let me take you through the vehicle and let me demonstrate actually how it works. I like it when you go to the vehicle all the time. So Srinath, what we have under the rear seat is all set of electric powertrain components. And what I'm going to demonstrate now is how the throttle is going to be detected by the motor controller. So my setup is right now, I have three terminals of the throttle as I explained just like the variable resistor. Now, these two terminals are connected to the negative and the output terminal uh, over here. And my meter is going to read how much is the DC voltage coming from the throttle as a signal. Now, if we change the position of the throttle, what you are going to experience, what you are going to read on this meter is the change in the voltage received by the motor controller. So if we turn on the power, we'll be able to see some voltage without the wheels rotating and that's it is something around 0.85 voltage. Now if we apply throttle, now depending on how much we have pressed, we are going to see the voltage changing across it. So this is the effect of pushing the throttle more and that's how we see the wheels are rotating at a higher speed. So the full throttle is going to go above 4 volt and that is going to be my top speed of the vehicle. How many feedback systems are actually involved in this entire process? We need majorly two types of feedbacks over here. One is the speed and other is the position of the rotor. So the speed is required to be estimated and it is required to be given to the controller so that it is going to compare 
how much is the actual speed of the vehicle and how much is the desired speed of the vehicle and then based on that the entire control system works but also it's very important to know what is the position of the rotor at a given instant of time in order to decide which are the next coils of the motor winding to be energized and therefore we need all effect sensor so these are the two types of main feedback mechanism we require some of the motor drives used for electric vehicle application may not use any rotor position sensor and they are called as a sensorless motor drive earlier you had said that these power inverters have have to operate switches right how, how many switches are there like this the control signals which are received from the throttle through the microcontroller they are going to decide for how much duration we need to turn on and turn off the switch but well actually it's not just one switch it is actually the combination of switches which operates together so usually the electric vehicle motors are three phase and that requires the change in the direction of current through each phase and this change in the direction is achieved by two phases one connected to the positive of the battery terminal and another connected to the negative of the battery terminal and therefore two switches per phase for a three phase motor you need total number of six switches sometimes in order to improve the current rating of the switches which are used for electric vehicle inverter you have multiple of six number of switches so i'm going to actually show you a motor controller which has total 24 number of switches so here i have a motor controller and i'm going to unscrew this and open up and explain how it looks like so from the outer side what you see is completely a heat sink and whole lot of wires coming out of it including uh, control cables and the power cables and if i take this out you are going to see is a printed circuit board so this is a motor controller which drives a three phase motor and you can see this motor controller consists of here here you can see the motor controller which has power semiconductor switches so this motor controller has mosfets used as power semiconductor devices and it's not just one mosfet there are group of mosfets so if you remember what we discussed about the operation you need minimum 6 or multiple of 6 mosfets for a motor controller here you have group of 4 in parallel and therefore 6 times 4 24 mosfets are here on this controller so this group of mosfets are mounted like this and here this is a heat sink which carries away all the heat generated by all the 24 mosfets together so like you can see it from this side mm. and on the other side in a similar way you are able to see this of okay. all group of mosfets so this is a thermal paste which is connecting to the exactly so okay. this is a white thermal paste which is going to mount your heat sink with okay and it's not just power devices you need a whole lot of circuit uh, there are a lot of capacitors you will see diode and other integrated circuit and definitely a brain which is going to operate this motor controller and this is a semiconductor device as you can see here okay. so this is uh, a microcontroller basically generates gate signal based on the throttle paddle uh, signal given by the driver and this is how this motor controller works excellent so this motor controller that we saw earlier is a rather big one Watsal over here has a smaller version of the motor controller with which he's going to demonstrate how the motor controller actually controls the motor and makes it spin is that right Watsal yes so here uh, we have got a lithium ion battery and the tiny motor controller which you are able to see here and it is connected with the motor which we have fixed to this part and i'm not connecting the hall sensors at all and this is going to be a demo of how the sensorless motor drive works so nowadays what you see uh, most of the electric vehicle 
uh, supplier, they are not going to rely on the hall sensors. They, it is going to operate uh, without any sensors. And let me demonstrate you how it works. So what I'm going to do now is ask the controller to generate the gate signals in such a way that it is able to spin the motor over here. Okay. And this is going to happen with a whole lot of software. So the size of the inverter that you look in over here, with the physical size, right? It has a whole lot of software behind it. And, and that software running behind it is going to control how the motor rotates. So let me show you how it works. So here we have a setup of a small brushless DC motor and I'm going to actually make it spin. So in order to get a small demo of an electric vehicle on the top of your table, uh, you need a setup where you have a lithium ion battery. So here we have a lithium ion battery connected to the motor controller, which you can see over here. And this motor controller is going to power up this motor and it is going to spin the way I want. And the beauty of this setup is we are not connecting the hall sensors of this motor at all. As you can see, uh, this connector uh, is actually not connected, uh, which are the hall sensors coming out from the motor. They are not connected to the motor controller at all. And if I'm doing the programming of that controller the right way, I'm going to run this motor without any sensor and that's called as a sensorless motor drive and nowadays the sensorless motor drives are very popular for electric vehicle application so let me just now configure this controller and show you how it spins so in the software i can actually check how much is the voltage of this and what is happening to all the three phase windings and i can actually check how it rotates. So you can see right now the motor is getting identified with the algorithm that we have. And yes, here it has started spinning. Okay. This is how your motor controller rotates the motor and runs your weight. Okay. Now let me show you one interesting thing. So let's say if I have this as a machine. Uh, it is actually acting as both motor and generator. Let me demonstrate you. So I'm going to now remove my battery and you can see my all lights on this controller uh, actually goes off, right? So you're not able to see any lights. Hmm. Are you able to see any lights? No. Okay. Now, if you try to spin this, this same machine act as a generator and it is going to power up some of the lights on this board. Can you try that? Okay. <laughs> oh. So, Srinath, uh, these are just LEDs which consumes power in milliwatt and this evaluation board does not need much of a power uh, to turn on this lights. But what really happens when you are really spinning and you are not really feeding the power from the battery, this acts as a generator and converts that kinetic energy of the vehicle and put it back to the battery. And that's how the regenerative braking works. So the next thing I'm going to do is now I will ask you to kind of connect the two terminals of the motor and try to feel what happens uh, when you try to spin your motor, spin the motor with your hand. Okay. So let me remove the three phases of the motor now. And you're going to connect it together? Yes. So Srinath, one another interesting thing I'm going to tell you about this motor is how it acts as a brake. So you will you'll feel the difference on the shaft of the rotor when you try to spin it without these two wires being connected and with two wires being connected. Can you try rotating the wheel now? Okay. How does it feel? Smooth. Okay. Now, just, I'm going to hold this two windings. Now, can you try running this motor? 
Oh, okay. That's quite it's quite hard to turn. Yeah, so this motor is actually applying a brake. Okay. And this control can be done with the help of a controller that we have seen earlier. Okay. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it is. It is awesome. Excellent. So this is the controller, uh, how it looks like. So this is very tiny little system which can actually reside on my palm. And here you have a intelligent 32-bit digital signal processor. On the top of it, you have actually an inverter. So these are the six MOSFETs that you are able to see here in the black color. And they are surface mounted MOSFETs. And on the top of it in the blue color, what you are able to see are the terminals for battery on the left side. And on the right side, you have three terminals, which is going to power up the motor. And this okay. is how a three phase inverter actually works. This is Skillings Masterclass on how electric vehicles work. Until now, we have seen the evolution of electric vehicles, their comparison with IC engine cars. And we also took a look at Skillings own test platform to understand electric vehicles better and to improve the student's learning journey. We just covered everything that we need to know about motors and motor controllers. Coming up next is the battery pack and the auxiliary system and how everything comes together as a single unit. Stay tuned with us. This is Skillings Masterclass on how electric vehicles work. Until now, we have talked about the evolution of EVs, Skillings own test platform, and motors and motor controllers. In this section, we're going to talk about batteries. What is the difference between the source of power in an IC engine car and, a electric, and an electric vehicle car? The fundamental difference is the amount of energy that you are able to store in the type of the fuel that you are using for that category of the vehicle. For example, the petrol and diesel have more than 10,000 watt hours per liter capability. Battery electric vehicle on the other hand, they have just 300 watt hours per liter capacity. So this is one fundamental difference. The other is how far you will be able to go with the vehicle after refueling your tank or by recharging the battery. And in case of an IC engine vehicles, if you have your tank full with the petrol or diesel, it will be going way far than an electric vehicle. And for an electric vehicle, it depends on how much capacity of the battery that you have. And the other difference is the duration of refueling. So for IC engine vehicle, it's quite possible to have five minutes of refueling. On the other hand, electric vehicles are going to take more time to recharge their batteries. We've been talking about rechargeable batteries when it comes to electric vehicles. Is it safe to assume that I can use any rechargeable battery to power an EV? You can use any rechargeable battery, provided that you are going to match three basic requirements. First is the performance requirements. Second is the cost and Third is basically you need to be more safe because it's going to power up the vehicle. So if you are matching these three requirements, you can use any rechargeable battery. But automakers have been trying to use majorly uh, lead acid battery, nickel metal hydride battery and lithium ion batteries for electric vehicle. Now, if I classify the materials being used for the construction of this lithium ion battery, they are mainly the positive negative electrode and electrolyte and a separator. Now, based on the material which is used to make the electrodes, there are six various types of lithium ion battery. Based on all the six types of categories, they have different behavior and they are used for different purposes. So, there are three chemistries which are very successful for electric vehicle. They are lithium ion phosphate, lithium titanium oxide and nickel manganese cobalt. So these are the three main chemistries people are evaluating for the purpose of electric vehicle. If I have two cars, one powered with a lithium ion battery and the other powered with a lead acid battery, how would the performances of the two cars compare? The performance are very different because this battery chemistries and the way they behave are very different. So first point is 
how much is the amount of power that you are able to store within the given volume. So let us say batteries have power density of which is less than 100 watt hours in a liter. And nowadays, various chemistries of lithium ion batteries are capable of having more than 300 watt hours per liter. So it's almost one third of the capacity that lead acid battery have compared with lithium ion battery. And this is going to actually affect the weight of the vehicle as well as and the range of the vehicle as well. So when, it, when, when, you are, when you are talking in terms of the range and the acceleration in the power performance of the battery, lithium ion battery is a clear winner. The next comparison point is the life cycle. How many times you are able to recharge a typical battery? So lead acid battery have usually lower life cycle, somewhere around 100 number of times you can charge and discharge. On the other hand, lithium ion batteries have so high number of life cycle, which are somewhere between 400 to a few thousands number of cycles. The next point I'm going to compare is uh, the safety and the cost. So lead acid batteries have been matured and the we have the recycling infrastructure for that well established. On the other side, lithium ion batteries are actually not that safe as well as costly. So if you put all points together, you'll figure out that lithium ion battery is a clear winner. It is just that very costly than the lead acid battery. These batteries can work across a wide range of voltages. Can you give us a couple of numbers to uh, put to these uh, ranges, what are the what are the maximum voltage? What's the minimum voltage? What is it like? If I talk about the voltage of the battery pack, well, it's not a constant. Batteries are not a constant voltage DC source, and their voltages are going to reduce when you discharge, and the battery voltage will increase when you charge. So batteries come up with a range of the voltages, and in order to do the selection of the electric vehicle battery pack, you need to ensure one thing which is the minimum voltage of your battery pack should be greater than the voltage required for motor to run the vehicle at the desired speed. There are two main categories of electric vehicle battery pack. One is a low voltage and another is a high voltage. Anything below 60 volt is considered as a low voltage battery pack and anything above that is high voltage battery pack. Now for electric vehicles, high voltage battery packs are more preferred because of one advantage. So let me give you a simple calculation. You take a 20 kilowatt hour of battery pack requirement. I can realize this battery pack as on two ways. One high voltage, which is let's say 400 volt and 50 ampere hours, or it can be low voltage, which is let's say 50 volt and 400 ampere hours. Now, both of this, so your, so your power is multiplication of voltage and current. And therefore, I can choose high voltage low current option or low voltage high current option. Now, if I go for low voltage high current option, my all the elements which are part of the circuit of an electric vehicle, they are going to have some finite value of resistance. And therefore, if the higher is going to be the current, higher is going to be the losses which are proportional to I square R. And therefore, the low voltage battery packs for electric vehicle are going to be inefficient. What is inside these battery packs? What does it look like? The consumer electronic devices such as your cell phone, right, or a tablet or the laptop, their battery packs are made up of one to six number of cells. And this is what is one such cell, right, which can be as small as your power bank or it can actually be part of your cell phone. Now, electric vehicle battery packs are much more powerful and their power demand cannot be satisfied only with one cell. So therefore you need a group of cells. So electric vehicle battery pack is combination of multiple such cells. It can be this type of cylindrical cell. I have a laptop battery pack with me or it can be group of such pouch cells. So you make a group of cells and that calls as a module and you have more than one module which is going to finally make the battery pack. How do you determine the number of cells required? For 20 kilowatt hour of battery pack, if I assume that each cell has a capacity of 5 ampere hour and the voltage of 3.6 volt, 
I need 100 number of cells in series so that my voltage, so that my total voltage is 360 volt and I need 11 number of cells in parallel so that my total capacity is 55 ampere hour. And if I do multiply this 360 volt with 55 ampere hour, I'm going to result approximately in 20 kilowatt hour of battery pack. So that is how the number of cells are calculated. Okay, and what do you mean by connecting series, uh, cells in series and connecting cells in parallel? So when I connect positive terminal of one cell with the negative terminal of the next cell, it is going to be a series connection. And in series connection, the voltages are going to add up. But when I connect all positive terminals and negative terminals of this cell group together, that is called as a parallel connection. So if I require, say, 100 cells in series and 11 cells or 12 cells in parallel, then does that mean that I will need a total of 111 cells? Uh, no, that's not true. You need not to just add number of series cells with the number of parallel cells because your battery pack is going to provide you the power and power is voltage times current. So you need to actually multiply the number of cells required in series with the number of cells required in parallel and therefore it's going to be 1100 number of cells for this entire battery pack. Okay, so you mean to say it's going to be 11 rows of 100 cells? Exactly. Okay, alright. Can you walk us through the key specifications, key technical specifications of a battery pack? The first technical specification is a voltage rating. Now, as we know, these voltages are not constant, so we need to see the boundaries. So, we need to check how much is the minimum voltage, which is called as a discharge cutoff voltage. And we need to also see how much is a fully charged voltage. And between these two, there is something defined as a nominal voltage for which the cell is going to provide its maximum of capacity. Now, another important rating is ampere hour. So, usually the cells which are uh, used for your cell phone application or laptop, they are their, their capacities are declared in milliampere hours, but electric vehicles are going to use high power and they require more amount of energy. So this battery packs, uh, the cells used for this battery pack are going to define in ampere hour. The next key important rating is the power. How much is the power that a typical cell is capable of delivering to the load? And that is voltage times current. Now current mainly is decided by the load which it tries to deliver the power for. The next key technical specification is the energy and that is called as a watt hour. And watt hour is simply the multiplication of its nominal voltage times its nominal capacity, which is voltage times ampere hour. Now, these are some of the key specifications which are electrical, but there are many more specifications defined in a data sheet of a cell. And one such is life cycle. Life cycle means how many times you are able to discharge and charge a typical cell throughout its life without compromising on its capacity. So one life cycle means discharging a cell from a fully charged condition to fully discharged condition. Getting back to something we had discussed earlier, you had said that the lowest voltage at which the battery operates has to be greater than the voltage at which the motor operates. What exactly does that mean? That is true for ideal operating condition. Uh, if I show you the discharge curve, which is part of a data sheet of a cell, that is going to indicate the voltage on the y-axis and capacity on the x-axis. Now, this capacity is derived at constant discharge current. But well, for your electric vehicle, are you going to discharge your battery pack always at a same current? No, because you are going to drive at various speed and your current is also going to vary according to how you are driving. And therefore, this capacity, which is declared capacity of a cell, is no longer going to be effective for the various discharge current rates. And this is defined as a C rate. Now, C rate is something, the rate at which you are discharging your battery. So we have taken the example of a 5 ampere hour battery. So if I keep on discharging that cell at 5 ampere continuously, 
Now that is one C rate of discharge. But well, my electric vehicle might need 10 ampere of current or more than that. At that time, that cell is said to be operating at 2C rate of discharge. Higher is going to be the discharge rate, lesser is going to be the effective capacity of that cell. The capacity also depends on the value of the temperature at which it is operating. Can you tell us the key technical specifications of the battery pack that we've used in the experimental vehicle? Uh, for Skillink electric vehicle, we have used lithium ion phosphate type of cell. The voltage rating is 60 volt and the capacity is 60 ampere hour. So total, this is going to be 3600 watt hours of energy that is available for the vehicle to run. We have a limit of maximum voltage through which you can charge and we have a limit of the minimum voltage through which below which you should not discharge. Apart from that, we have the limits on maximum current, uh, which is 170 ampere maximum discharge current. And we have the limits on the charging current also, which is 30 ampere of charging current. So this is what are the key technical specifications of the battery pack that we are using. Okay. And throughout the discussion, we've been talking about the battery operating at various voltages, it having to regulate the rate at which the current is being discharged. How does it actually do that? Because from the looks of it, it seems that the battery is connected to the motor controller, which in turn is connected to the motor, right? But the motor controller is busy taking care of the motor. What is taking care of the battery? Yes, there is a device which takes care of all these limits, which we need to follow. The motor controller, on the other hand, is going to control the power and it's a power converter. But here, inside the battery, we do not need a power converter. We, what we need is a limiter. What we need is a protection circuit. And a single cell like this is not intelligent enough to decide whether it is going to get overcharged or whether it is going to be un fully discharged. And that limits has to be provided by some intelligent system called as battery management system. Okay, so it's more like a trip switch. Yes, the task of a battery management system is to protect all the cells which are connected together inside the battery pack. And it's not only about the voltage limits, you need to take care of the current limits as well, and you need to take care of the temperature as well. So this all limits are followed by a device called as battery management system. What is the technology that goes in to building a battery management system? Battery management system consists of three major components. First, in order to provide protection, you need to keep on monitoring the voltage, current and temperature of many cells inside the battery pack. And then you have to decide whether the situation is a fault or a normal situation. And based on that, the BMS is going to either connect or disconnect the battery pack with the load or the charger. This battery management system also needs to indicate how much is a charge left within it so that the user is going to know how much is a distance to empty. Can we take a look at how a battery management system module actually looks like? Here I have a battery management system which is actually open up and I can show you what it can just of. So let me put all these things down. I'm going to remove the connector as well. So. A battery management system is a simple printed circuit board which looks like this and this is capable of managing a 24 volt battery pack. So this is 8 cell series battery management system which is capable of delivering the current up to 30 ampere and through this connector all the voltages of the cells connected in series will be sensed and it will be given to this integrated circuit. This integrated circuit is going to decide whether any of the cell voltage is above or beyond the limit and if such a condition arises it is going to disconnect the battery pack from the load and this disconnect is going to happen through the MOSFETs as you can see there are four MOSFETs uh, mounted over here they are going to connect or disconnect based on whether the fault condition is there or not on the top of it uh, you can see a current sensor and a temperature sensor which keeps on monitoring the battery pack current and the temperature and therefore it not only provides the voltage protection but also the current and temperature protection. 
Well, this is for a small uh, electric scooter for 24 volt. What about the vehicle that we have and which is at a much higher power? For a battery pack that we have for the vehicle, it is 60 volt and therefore we need slightly a different type of a BMS. And if you have higher current requirement, then you need to have a bigger board. And how do you charge an EV? There are multiple ways in which you can charge it. First thing is the battery is DC and you are going to take the power which is available in the normal power outlet which is the AC type of a power supply. So you need a converter in between which converts AC power to the DC power. Now this depends on what is the capacity of the battery that you have. So for a two-wheeler and three-wheeler you need a charger which is which can be plugged to any single phase outlet for four wheeler you need a three phase supply because they require more power at a time if i give you an example of the charging time you take 100 ampere hour of battery pack for your electric vehicle and if i have a 10 ampere of charger i am going to charge this battery in 10 hours there are two modes of charging the lithium ion battery one is a constant current in which you are going to maintain the current constant throughout that period and which is up to 80 percentage of the level of the battery and after that you are going to charge the battery in constant voltage mode which is for the remaining 20 percentage level of the battery and this combination of cc mode constant current and cv mode which is constant voltage will be applied together by the power converter called as a battery charger is charging an ev any different from charging a mobile phone or a laptop? Fundamentally, it is same, but there are certain differences. Let me tell you the first part. While you are charging a laptop, right, you are going to connect the external adapter and that is basically the AC to DC converter. Now, for electric vehicles, that AC to DC converter is part of the vehicle and that's why it's called as onboard charger. Now, when it comes to the power level, there are various types of power level to charge the EV depending on whether you are charging your electric cycle or an electric bus. And these charging systems are so of variety in nature that these adapters look almost same but they are different and bigger than your laptop or cell phone chargers. Is it possible for us to take a look at one of these uh, charging boards? So what you see here is an electric vehicle battery charger and fundamentally this is a power converter converting from AC input over here. So these are the three wires going from the single phase AC supply and here you have the DC output. Now this is going to convert AC into DC in two stages. One is the AC to DC rectification and DC to DC conversion, which takes care of constant current and constant voltage mode of charging the electric vehicle. Where do you charge an electric vehicle? I can charge electric vehicle almost anywhere where the electrical supply is available. So electrical supply can be taken from the outlet and you can give it to the onboard charger. And there are two ways. And there are two ways for it. One is called as AC charging and one is the DC charging. And usually you can charge your vehicle at your home with a single phase supply for two wheelers and three wheelers and bicycles. And for four wheelers, you need a sophisticated charging infrastructure in which you need to have electric vehicle supply equipment and you need a three phase power for that. And this is how the electric vehicle battery packs can get charged. And I've heard of something called as fast charging. Can you tell us a bit more about that? DC fast charging is going to directly connect the DC output terminals from the external charger. The onboard charger of an electric vehicle is, it's not that powerful, but I can actually charge my battery pack with a more powerful DC charger, which is outside the vehicle. And it is going to charge at the more ampere and therefore more fast. Now, DC fast chargers will require more infrastructure in terms of charging station and it's not going to be just like your refueling station. You need to arrange for the distance between the two points of charging. You need to take care of the safety. You need to also look for whether 
enough amount of electricity is available from that electrical connection and that is taken care by the charging station design engineers. This is Killing's masterclass on how electric vehicles works and we talked about batteries. Until now, we've covered everything about the evolution of EVs, Skilllink's own test platform, motors and motor controllers. Coming up next is the auxiliary systems and how everything comes together as a single unit. Stay tuned. This is Skilllink's masterclass on how electric vehicles work. If you've not watched our previous sections, we strongly recommend that you do because you'll be missing out on a lot. In this section, we're going to talk about the auxiliary systems of this vehicle and how it all comes together to form a single unit. So I can see that the battery is now powering the uh, electric motor, but there are a lot of associated components also along with the vehicle, right? For example, there are headlights, there is a indicator, there is a horn, uh, the dashboard itself. So are these components also powered by the main battery pack or do we have a separate source for it? Well, uh, the traction or uh, propulsion power, that is much higher requirement of power. And on the other side, auxiliary systems are uh, low power and they do not consume much of power. And they are usually very standardized and they operate at 12 volts. Uh, the electric vehicle battery packs will be somewhere uh, between 60 volt to 400 volt and you cannot connect directly that much of high voltage to your auxiliary system. So we need a separate source and the other reason we need a separate source is for example if your uh, traction battery pack is running out of the power and you still need to open your car with your keyless entry, right? You need to still have your cabin lights running on and you need headlights also to turn on simultaneously. Do you also use a lithium-ion battery for this or is it a different battery? Well, it's not necessary that we need to use lithium-ion battery only. The reason is auxiliary systems are low powered and they operate at low voltage. So we can go for a low cost uh, lead acid battery as well. So in, in our vehicle, we have used 12 volt lead acid battery which is uh, widely available. In IC engine cars, you have an alternator to charge the battery as such. Over here, how do you charge it? Is it charged by the motor or do you have a different mechanism to charge the battery? We have a charger which is going to be connected to the traction battery pack. This traction battery pack is going to actually charge the traction battery and we can take that power to charge the auxiliary battery. This is the main traction battery pack and this is the 12 volt lead acid battery which we are talking about. Now, this lithium ion battery at 60 volt is connected to this 12 volt battery through this DC DC converter. And this DC DC converter is going to take care of all the auxiliary loads which are going to be powered by more than the capacity of this 12 volt lead acid battery. So, you can see the lead acid battery will also get charged from the same DC DC converter which is connected over here. So, we need to have a connect of high voltage traction battery and the low voltage auxiliary battery and that is possible by keeping a DC to DC converter in between. And why do you differentiate between the two? Why can't it be a single system as such? Well, it's a DC system and you can look at that as a same thing. The fundamental reason is actually the safety. So high voltage systems are likely to get a severe shock and here it's a DC system, right? So human being uh, will not get a chance to get out of the shock, right? Because there is no zero crossing, just like your AC system. So therefore, uh, this high voltage system and the low voltage systems are required to be isolated between each other. Are all auxiliary systems running on the same voltage? Because there's only a single uh, 12 volt battery, uh, which is available for everything. There are various components which work on 12 volts. Uh, for example, your uh, air conditioning system, your horn, headlights and side lights. But there are other components which require other than 12 volt as well. Uh, if I talk about your infotainment system or your music system of the car, that requires 5 volt. And if you even go further, there are other components or for example, a semiconductor chip or integrated circuits, 
they require 3.3 volts. So auxiliary systems themselves have a wide range of operating voltage. It might be 12 volt, it might be 5 or even as low as 3.3 volt. Okay, so is it safe to assume that all components that require a single voltage, say there are three components that run on 5 volts and three components that run on 3.3 volts, is it safe to assume that all these components are connect, convert are connected to a single uh, DC DC converter, or do you have to differentiate between those as well? Well, that can be done, uh, but not for all the loads. The reason being, all the loads have their own nature of operating. Some of the auxiliary loads will operate directly on the voltage which is given. The other will require a regulator. So we cannot combine all the 5 volt load to one DC DC converter and all the 3.3 volt loads to the common DC DC converter. So instead of a unique DC DC converter, there will be individual DC to DC converters uh, applied at the end of all the loads. Okay, let's, let's take a step back and look at the entire electric vehicle as a single unit. How do you connect all these components? Because there are so many of them. You have the, you have the traction motor, you have the a motor controller, you have the BMS, you have the auxiliary systems like the indicators, the headlights. How do you connect all of these together? Electric vehicles are actually uh, having less number of moving parts, but at the same time, there are more electrical electronic components. So, if you see the skeleton of an electric vehicle uh, without any body, uh, you will see the number of wires running through the body. And this is called as wiring harness. Can you, can you explain what a wiring harness is? This is a new term that you're using now. Well, wiring harness is a group of wires connected together. And uh, as you know, there are many wires we need. And the entire network of the wire, along with the connectors, that is called a wiring harness. From electrical point of view, I can classify into two categories. One is the wires which carries high voltage and high current, and we call them as a power cables. Now, other category of wiring harness is the control cables or control signals. And this control cables are going to carry the signals which are at low voltage, for example, 5 volt. So here I have a hub motor in my hand, it requires to be powered from the three phases. And the output of the inverter is going to be connected here. Well, these three wires are going to form the power cables because they are going to carry the high voltage and high current. Now, on the other hand, you see this connector, uh, which is a group of thin wires, uh, which is for the hall sensor. So you have three hall sensors and two supply for positive and negative and therefore there are five wires going, coming out of this connector. So how do you actually keep track of which wire is supposed to go where and how do you organize this? I'm sure there's a method to this madness. Well, that is done uh, very systematically. Uh, so for example, I need to understand at the time of design of the wiring harness that where I'm going to connect what and which component is connected where is going to be well identified by either its color or any tag identifier so that way the wiring harness will have its own way of identifying the wire and if you if you go back to the so one step back where the way they are designed from the schematic to the wiring harness there are a lot of softwares used such as ketia uh, where you can convert your circuit diagrams into a sophisticated wiring harness and you can get more idea about how these wires are actually laid down. Okay, and are there any special considerations that need to be kept in mind while designing a wiring harness? Well, there are a lot of design considerations. Let me talk first about mechanical design considerations. So mechanical design considerations are you need to group the wires. Uh, so for example, uh, in our vehicle, we use a cable tie uh, to group them together. In a typical wiring harness of an electric vehicle, uh, you need to take care of how they are going to be grouped, what is the amount of length uh, that they should have, 
and what is going to be the path that they will follow. So let's say you are going to connect uh, your throttle wire from the front of the vehicle to the back of your rear axle where your motor controller is. So you, need, you need a systematic way of routing the wires through the entire body of the vehicle. Uh, we also need to understand how this wire, group of wires are going to be fixed with the chassis. So these are a set of mechanical considerations. What about electrical considerations? So if I talk about electrical considerations, the one thing you need to take care is uh, how these cables are going to have the shortest path. Because more is going to be the length of the wire, higher is going to be the resistance and higher will be the losses. Right? So we need to see how we can uh, minimize the length of the wire and which should be also mechanically feasible. The other important electrical consideration is how you differentiate uh, between the control signals and the power signals. So usually power signals are going to be switched at a very high frequency. We earlier discussed about uh, uh, there are inverters which are going to turn on and turn off the power switches and that generates a lot of noise. And this noise should be out of the reach of the control signals. So the important electrical consideration for the wiring harness is how you are going to isolate them uh, magnetically so that the, your noise is not going to be transmitted either through conduction or through radiation to the any part of the control circuitry. Let's take a look at the driver's console now because that is at the heart of the driving experience, right? Because that's where all the control signals are culminating. This is where the driver gets all the information that they require to keep control of the car. So I think I can explain it better with the help of the car. So let's go there. Okay. So beneath this dashboard, we have so many chunk of wires which are coming in and going out where you can see uh, this is all coming from the battery, lead acid battery, traction battery. Also, we have a speed indicator and it's, it's a group of uh, all input and output to the entire vehicle. So this is just like acting as a switchboard of your house. And over that, we have a whole lot of other wires, including let's say if you are handbrake is placed, I do not want the vehicle to move out. If, if your uh, steering is also locked, I do not want the vehicle to move out and therefore this will be disengaged. So this dashboard has a feature of protecting the vehicle in case of any fault occurs. So if I just turn on, let's say your battery level is low or you have applied the brakes and you are applying the throttle simultaneously that is not going to work because when you apply this brake or the hand brake your throttle is electronically deactivated and that's how this dashboard is going to protect uh, the overall operation of the vehicle clearly you need to make a lot of calculations before you actually go about and building this vehicle now how do you make sure that the calculations that you have made are correct the first step is doing hand calculation Engineers do a lot of hand calculation to come up with the estimated values and hand calculations are not just enough. You need to take the help of computer simulations to do multiple calculations based on your inputs. So we develop the simulating model of the entire electric vehicle and we try to get the data out of the computer simulation and that help us to decide not only on the parameters and rating of the components that we are going to use, but that also help us to predict the performance of the electric vehicle that we are going to come up with. Excellent. I think we've been sitting inside or rather standing inside for a very long time now and I am itching to go drive the vehicle. So I'm going to take the vehicle out for a spin and once I come back, we are going to compare the data that I've logged with the vehicle with the simulations that you've done and see what happens after that. All right? Sure. Excellent. Let's go.
that was so much of fun driving the vehicle and it was completely worth the wait but i think it's time to get down to business can you show us what the differences or similarities were with respect to the data that we logged from the car and the simulations that you have performed so while the vehicle was running we applied a clamp on meter to the to measure the current of the battery now that gives me the value of the battery current at every second and in the simulation result well it's not exactly matching now if we dive deep into the differences why the simulator results and the experimental results are not exactly matching i'm going to tell you what are the couple of parameters that we have ignored during the simulation so let's say how much was the tire pressure we didn't really measured while doing the experiment and we really do not know how much is the actual rolling resistance of the wheels that we have used in the vehicle we also do not have the vehicle body and to estimate the aerodynamic drag coefficient for this vehicle is going to be a difficult task this was skillings masterclass on how electric vehicles work and thanks to watsel i now know enough to show off to my friends and i hope you guys learned a lot too if you are interested in more courses on electric vehicles and other streams of engineering visit skilling.com today